morning, everyone. For, you know, the few of us in the room who are all basically paid to be here. Uh, it's good to see you. In an ironic twist of events, moving away from the Gospel of Matthew, please open to Matthew chapter 1. Um, <laughs> That's where we're at in this Advent season. Well, happy. I hope you had a good Thanksgiving, family. I um, certainly did. I know I heard tons of stories about people having different, like, foods they ate this season or, like, tried different things, and families were smaller or separated. But there is a lot to be thankful for. Um, Even this weekend, before it all, you know, Thanksgiving happened, I went with some of my friends to Salt and Straw, and just as an odd story, um, they they had Thanksgiving flavored ice cream. So if you had that and got to partake... Bless you and bless God. Um, Anyway, we're going to open up to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 1. And if you have it, if you're willing and if you're able, would you please stand for the reading of God's word? Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to start at verse 17. Thus, there were 14 generations in all from from Abraham to David. 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet he did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Let's read this part out loud together. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. This is God's word. So may we be good hearers of the word and better doers. May we love Jesus deeply in this season. May we trust what he says, and may we follow Jesus well. Amen. You may be seated. If you need a title, just because that's helpful for some people, uh, the title of this sermon is called Middle of the Mess. Middle of the Mess. I have a question for you. Uh, How soon is too soon to put up a Christmas tree? I know it's like a contested debate, and all throughout the holidays, um, there's different people who say different things. One of my best friends normally puts up her tree right after Halloween. I personally think it's too early, but, you know, do what you got to do. Most years, I wait until after Thanksgiving, but this year, I kind of, you know, did it. I did the third week of November. I just felt like I needed it. Anyone else, like, did a Christmas? Okay, cool. A couple other people. I'm hoping I wasn't the only one. Actually, the Washington Post put out an article that talked about the seeming uptick in people putting up their Christmas decorations early this year. All over the country, people began to put up their decorations sooner than normal. It's almost comical because there have been pandemic-themed ornaments this year. Have you heard about those? Uh, Masks, toilet paper, hand sanitizer, and even an Anthony Fauci uh, ornament. Yes, you can see those. Sales for Christmas decorations have been higher this year. One store owner even said that he was asked for Christmas lights in August. Now, while most years I would say people who start way too early have lost it, I think that everyone gets a free pass in 2020. Who wouldn't want Christmas a little bit early this year? I mean, like after a year like this, I was personally ready to go help put the tree up in Pioneer Square myself on Labor Day if that would make this year end sooner, if it would ease the pain. But that got me thinking, could all of the rushing to get Christmas here faster just be our way of getting out of this year? Is Christmas just a way of bearing what's underneath the surface? Are we trying to eat our way through uncertainty or shop our way through stress or distract ourselves from discomfort? Are we avoiding the mess by just sweeping it under the rug? A part of me wonders if a lot of our Christmas celebrations are a fun form of escapism. 
Christmas is not what we celebrate. I know that might sound weird, but Christmas is the name of the celebration. We don't celebrate Christmas. Christmas is is celebrating something else. And family, there is something worth celebrating in this season. It's something I think all human beings long for and ache for. And it's something that Matthew wants us to get. Now, Matthew has in his mind and imagination, it's all steeped in the Hebrew scripture. He opens chapter one with a genealogy, which I know is everyone's favorite part of their Bible reading plans. Anyone else? Yeah. In short, Matthew's genealogy, though, it summarizes and culminates the whole story of the Bible into just a few verses. So think about it. God created humanity to rule on earth. And when you think of rule, don't just think like dominate and subdue however you want or use however you want. Think of nurture, care for, turn into something beautiful. But just a few pages into the story of humanity, if you know the story, we don't do too hot. So God works to get things back on track through a single family, a single people, a single nation called Israel or the family of Abraham. The idea is God is going to use this one family and what happens in this one people will be what happens with the whole world or it helps the whole world. So as the Bible story goes on, we see again, this family, they don't do, do so hot. God works, and he works to get things back together. Instead of this nation, he moves down to another family, a line of kings through the line of David. They don't do too hot either. Some of them do okay, but none of them really help get humanity and the world out of the mess it's in. By the time we get to Matthew, there's this longing and this ache. Matthew and his people have been waiting, and they've been looking for, and they've been hoping for a solution. They've been expecting and waiting for and longing for help. Matthew has a longing and an ache that I think we understand. It's the ache of seeing the world as it, you know, it's not really as it should be. Not everything is bad, but things are not really as good as we hope them to be. Have you ever longed for things to get better? Have you desired for an end of injustice and evil or pain? Have you wanted to see an end to sickness or brokenness or hurt? Have you tired of suffering, both self-inflicted or externally imposed? If you say yes to any of those things, then you get where Matthew's coming from. That's the longing and the ache that Matthew's world knows so well. And that's where Matthew's story picks up. Look at verse 18. Joseph and Mary, they're engaged. Sometime during their engagement, though, Mary's found to be pregnant. And Joseph knows that he's not the father. Sorry, Mary. People 2,000 years ago, they didn't find this moment to be so miraculous as at first or as we did. They understood where babies come from. So Joseph, he looked for a way to divorce Mary quietly. But then in verse 20, an angel appears to Joseph, which is basically what I think I would need if I were in that situation. The angel tells him that Mary's child has been conceived by the Holy Spirit. (sighs) Sigh of relief. And Joseph is to give the child the name, Sunday school answer, Yeshua. We now say Jesus, but Jesus is really the Greek transliteration of the Hebrew name Yeshua. The name was super common. I know personally, like, I kind of find it odd when I meet someone named Jesus or someone who names their kid Jesus, but it was a normal name then, like the name Joshua today, who doesn't have at least, like, four Joshes in their phone, right? The name was a common but meaningful name. It means Yahweh saves. It was a name that is both a reminder and a prayer that the one true God would save. Look at verse 21. The angel tells Joseph to name the child Yahweh saves, and then he tells us why. Because he will save. So who's the he referring to? Yahweh or the child? Who's going to do the saving? Yahweh or the child? To which the answer is both. That's the point Matthew is making here. This is no ordinary child. The ache and the longing for help to come is beginning to be answered. And it's being answered by God himself. When the family of Abraham can't fully do it and the line of David can't fully do it, God shows up and does it himself. Matthew is claiming that God is coming to earth in this child named Jesus. And that is what we celebrate. We're celebrating the arrival or the coming of God. And that's why many Christian traditions call this season Advent, which means coming. Christmas tells us that God came. Yahweh has shown up. Now, have you ever considered how odd it is that we can be so kind of neutral about that claim? Like we're claiming God has shown up. 
and we're kind of neutral about it. Like millions of people around the planet right now take four weeks to celebrate that Yahweh has come. The true God of the universe has entered the building. Now, I don't personally think it's so crazy to believe in God. Maybe it's just because I grew up in church. But sure, in the secular West, we may feel like a minority in that regard. But remember, so much of the world is not the secular West. Most of the world has not progressed past a worldview with various gods or spiritual beings, which let me say is not the same as believing in Yahweh, the God of the Bible. Nonetheless, most people live in a place that holds a belief in supernatural beings or gods, etc. Asia, 60% of the world's population. Africa is 17% of the world's population. South America, 5% of the world's population. Put that together and we see over 80% of the world lives in places that believe in some form of God, God, supernatural, or spiritual beings. Even the Western world, for most of its history, believed in some sort of gods. Whether it's Rome or Greece or the states or even the deists, those who do not believe in any form of God or supernatural are in the very small minority of human history. Most of the world, especially people of color globally, is on board with some form of God, gods, or supernatural beings. Christmas, though, does not just claim the existence of supernatural beings or the existence of God in general. Christmas claims that the one true God, who is a Trinitarian community of love, who spoke the world into existence, who made every human being and all of creation, who is gracious and compassionate, merciful, kind, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, that God has come into earth. He's become human. He has stepped into the story. Christmas means that God, Yahweh, has come to save. Now, if that's true, then Christmas is saying that something that's so radical, and it says it to the left and to the right, to the rich and to the poor, to the religious and to the secular. Christmas does not say that we just need some tips. It doesn't just say that we need some help. It doesn't say that we just need some self-improvement or more education or, or technological advancements or better medicine or finally that cure for diabetes or cancer or better advice or better government or better friends or you name it. While, those thing, while all those things are good and they can help, Christmas says that what we really need is saving. We need rescue. We need help from outside of ourselves. Our city and our lives have some real problems that need addressing. And 2020 has made at least me more attuned to the reality that the problems in my world are a lot bigger than I can manage on my own. Christmas says, though, that God has come and that you and I need saving, which raises the question, what do we need saving from? Now, next time you drive around Portland, or even for a second, just imagine your commute to wherever you might commute or probably don't anymore, but imagine where you used to commute to, right? Um, or bike to or whatever that is. Next time you drive around Portland, just look at some of the signs in front of houses or in windows or on car bumpers. So many of these signs are telling us what the problem is. Our city says that we need to be saved from racism, injustice, Trump, Biden, the right, the left, big business, capitalism, Antifa, the Proud Boys, poor education, a lack of science, and every type of phobe out there. While I'm not critiquing these signs, I'm just wanting to point out that all these signs in some way are telling us how to clean the mess. They're signs telling us what we need to be saved from. And it's not just the signs in our streets or in our windows or in the apartment next door. It's also the conversations going on in our hearts and in our heads. We can subtly believe that if fill in the blank is, is the problem in the world, or that blank is the real problem in my life, or if I only fix, then my life will finally be of the right sort of quality. If I only have fill in the blank, then things will be okay. If I could just diminish this or have less of this or maximize my happiness, then the world will be okay, I'll be okay, the problems will be gone, the mess will be gone, the mess will be clean, I'll be safe. We all have deep and often unconscious beliefs about what the real problems are. But the Bible's word for most of the problems in the world is sin. Even if that word seems to be antiquated or even triggering in our city, Matthew tells us in verse 21 that Yahweh has come to save people from their sins. Sin, in many senses, is about failure, but it's not just about making mistakes or doing bad things. Sin is the breaking of relationship between humans and God and creation itself. Sin is not being a truly good human with goodness defined, not by ourselves or by our society, but by God himself. Sin is the failure to be a proper creation as defined by the creator. Sin is a part of what we call the collective evil in the world. Things like the enslaving or trafficking of human beings. 
the misuse of power that destroys communities, various forms of evil and injustice. We can each probably create a list, right? And that's part of what the Bible calls sin. Sin makes a mess of the world, but sin is not just out there. Sin is also in here. Sin is what all human beings are impacted by. It's the gossip that's so easy to justify. It's the drinking that was just a little too much. It's the inner brokenness that turns God-created sexuality and a sexual drive into lust. It's the temper that we can't really seem to control with the people who are closest to us. Sin isn't just vague and out there. It's not just that one person or that person who does it to you. It's in here. It's what God is trying to expose in each of us as well. Even in these past months, God's been helping me see that while I don't really lose my temper and yell at people who are close to me, instead I can feel superior in gossip. Or I get annoyed and become condescending. Or I mean, when I'm feeling uncaring, I can just be uncaring and just withdraw from the people in my life. I may want to justify it or call it something else, but I think the word for that, according to the Bible, is sin. Sin is the mess in the world out there, but it's also the mess in my heart in here. And as we've said so many times before in this church, the line separating good and evil passes right through the human heart. Sin impacts us all because even when it's not the things that we do, sin is often the mess that has been done to us. So many of the problems in our world happen not only because of our sin, but because other people have sinned. We could all probably share stories about how someone else's sin has made a mess of our life or our community or our city or our family. Matthew, he shares the story of how God has come to deal with the real problems in the world and in you and in me because we cannot on our own. God has come to save people from their sins. Now, Matthew tells us that when God comes to save his people, he's first talking about Israel in particular. Now, don't worry about like FOMO um, if you're afraid of missing out because what God does through Israel, it becomes a gift to the whole world. When Jesus saves Israel from their sins, he in turn makes salvation from sin available to the whole world. And that is great news. God has come to bring healing to the world. He's come to answer our deepest aches, to begin to bring an end to sickness and disease and injustice and war and violence and poverty and evil and addiction and trauma and hurting and all forms of pain and illness and even death itself. Advent seems like the most wild, but maybe the most honest story ever told. It's so moving to think that God has come to save. But can I tell you what stirs me even more? It's how God comes to save. God does not just show up in glamour. He does not show off all his glory. God shows up in a really subtle way. As verse 23 tells us, the creator God becomes like his creation. He takes on dirt and flesh. Can you just picture that for a second? God shows up and becomes vulnerable. He becomes woundable. He becomes betrayable. He becomes hurtable. He becomes killable. God shows up as a little baby. What's more vulnerable than that? In the next chapter of Matthew, he tells us that God's first moments living and breathing as a human being on earth would be spent fleeing for his life. His family had to go on the run from a small genocide of boys under the age of two. That's God showing up. God didn't show up into a picture-perfect story. Hebrews 2 tells us that God put on skin and bone. Philippians 2 says that God took on the form of a servant. John 1 says that God came and tabernacled or dwelled among us, but not as a passive observer. As we read the accounts of Jesus like Matthew, we see that Jesus lives the full human life. He understands poverty. He experienced suffering. He wept at his friend's grave. He must have lived through loneliness. He subjected himself to sickness and sorrow. In other words, family, God, he gets it. He gets what it's like to be human. He's not aloof. He gets our pain. He gets our problems. He gets our temptations. He gets our trials. He understands what it's like to pray, God, let this pass from me. God willingly subjects himself to the whole human experience. Or as I'd like to say, God got into the middle of the mess. It's one thing now to have someone who cares about your problems or even someone who feels sorry for you when you're going through something hard. But it's another thing entirely to have someone who just gets it. Like they get it. They were there. They've been through it. You know what I'm saying? As the writer of Hebrews says, we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. 
While Matthew 1 is specifically talking about God showing up to save humanity from sin, I've also come to be really thankful, especially in this season, in this year, for all the other little ways that God has just shown up. I'm thankful for the ways that God is with us and present and available through all of the mess. God is present. I mean, that's the story of Christmas. God is present. And I found that presence, showing up for others, especially when you don't have to, is one of the greatest acts of love. This sort of love, joy, peace, and hope are what the Advent season is supposed to produce in us. We're called to be people of hope, people of peace, people of joy, people of love. Now, many Christians, they light candles and read prayers and immerse themselves in scriptures as ways to stay centered during Advent. We as a church, like we said earlier, we're going to reflect on each of these four themes, love, joy, peace, and hope over the coming weeks. So just for a moment, I'd like to reflect on how God's coming is a message of love. I would argue that God shows his love by showing up. I said it before, God is present and presence, showing up for others, especially when you don't have to, especially at your own expense, is one of the greatest acts of love. And truthfully, I think we all know this from experience. I mean, how do you and I often measure someone's love for us? It's not by the gifts that they give us or maybe the cards that they write or the words that they share. It's by them showing up. We measure the love of the people in our lives by the ways in which they show up for us. The people who we think of as loving are the people who, show, who just show up. They're the people who are there through it thick and thin, the people who just stuck it out with us. The people who we feel most loved by are the people who are just present, especially when we're not looking too cute, like especially when things aren't that clean. The people who are there, as some would say, when your hair is down, you know? Those are the people who we feel most loved by. And the opposite is often true. We feel most hurt and betrayed when people don't show up. When people say they'll be there and they don't come through. When people are, all, people are late to something that we care deeply about. When, we, when people forget that special day, or even worse, when they don't remember that anniversary that's really painful for you to remember. When people are cold, when you need comfort, they didn't show up emotionally. When you have a physical need and they just say, hey, I'm sorry about that. They didn't show up financially. When people are texting while you're talking, it's hurtful. Why? Because they're not really present. Love is ex often expressed, and we know this intuitively. Love is often expressed by presence. And I know this so deeply myself from experience. My engagement ended a year ago and it was one of the most painful seasons of my life. And if I could tell you like what got me through it and what brought the most healing and what just really sustained me wasn't the people who like just took me out to meals, which I'm so thankful for those people. It wasn't the people who were texting me, how are you doing? It wasn't the people who were just like, hey, it's gonna be okay, God thing works all things together for the good. It was the people who just hugged me when I cried. It was the people who showed up in my living room and just stood there with me in silence. It was the people who watched a TV show with me when I just didn't have anything else to say. And it was the people who didn't ask, how are you doing? Because they'd been there the whole time. What loved me most was people's presence. And I think it's the same for you. I'll never forget being in junior high. My parents got a divorce when I was in junior high and um, it was just a, a, a crazy season. Um, I remember how like messy it felt in that season. And right around that same time, I had like recommitted my life to Jesus. I had also had like a few friendships that were like dissipating that I'm thankful to God for now. Oh, thank you, Jesus. But in the season, it was like all of my friends were disappearing. I just felt lonely in certain ways, but I just didn't know what was going on. I couldn't explain it. Me and my two younger siblings, we were traveling between our parents' homes every two weeks. And I remember sitting in my little bedroom, I had painted it myself, which was such a weird decision by my mom, but I'd painted it myself and the walls were like this ugly blue, <laughs> but whatever. And like, yeah, we won't even get into it. I painted it myself and I had just enough room in my, in my bedroom for this little couch that was beside my bed. So you imagine the edge of my bed and then like just a foot of space, enough for you to kind of like shimmy through. And I was sitting on my couch one night and I was just thinking and reflecting going, wow, like this is not what I expected to be my life. 
Have you ever asked that question or felt that? Like, God, this isn't what I expected. And I was a Christian kid. I had like recommitted my life to God. I had this feeling like I was called to ministry. And um, so I did what like any person with that and my personality type would do. I like, knew the right thing to do. So I cracked up in my Bible. Let's be honest, like I probably did Bible roulette where you just like, whatever is there is there. And if it's Song of Solomon, so be it. And I, I remember cracking open my Bible and being like, God, just say something. Just give me a word. God, I just need you to say something. And I was met with silence. And I remember then just going, okay, if, if it's not in the Bible for this moment, maybe God just like, God, okay, I'll listen, I'll listen. Okay, uh, I couldn't find a scripture to hold me, but like, God, would you just speak? I, I'm here, my hands are opened. I didn't even know, but I'm doing listening prayer in junior high. Like, God, like, would you just say something? I was silent. Ever been there? Ever been met with just silence? But as I sat in that silence... I can so clearly remember just feeling something. It was like a presence was in the room or a person came into the room. And I just knew that God was with me. It's one of those things that like, if you experience it, you get it. I just remember God was there and that silence was not absence, but muted presence. And so I sat there and I don't remember how long I sat there I remember sitting there and just feeling that God was in the room with me. And as I sat there, this little junior high brain, a scripture came to mind. They will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Sure, my then junior high self was thinking of that verse somewhat out of context. Matthew is saying that Emmanuel is ultimately about God showing up to save people from their sins. And that is God's ultimate expression of love. But even though my junior high self didn't have an understanding of that scripture that was technically right, I did have an experience of God's presence that was deeply real. That's what I needed in that moment. God just showed up and he was present to me in the mess. Presence is one of the greatest acts of love, which is why I find it so beautiful and fitting that the final words of Matthew's gospel are Jesus' promise. Surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Christmas shows the love of God in such a wild way. What sort of God is this? What sort of love is this? This is a God unlike any other. This is a God whose arrival actually means love. This is a God who shows up. And maybe we can just be that sort of people in this season. Can we be people who just show up for others? There's been so much hatred and heartache and hurting and everything in between this year. But imagine what it could look like for you in the next week just to show up for people with incarnational presence. Maybe take a moment to write down, even now, like pull out your phone or write it down just for a moment, what it could look like to practically show up for Portland in the next days or to show up for someone in your community or to just be present to a friend or a family member at your own expense. Maybe there's someone in your community or just like your day-to-day -day life who's caused some problems or has been just like less than ideal. <laughs> what would it look like to show up for them physically, emotionally, financially, spiritually? What would it be like to show up and love them well. You know, even as I finished writing this sermon over the weekend, I had a person's face just keep coming to my mind. My friend has been going through it. Actually, I can think of two different friends right now who are going through it. And being honest, it can sometimes feel like inconvenient to be present to people's pain. But being inconvenienced is often the cost of being loving. How could you being a, be a loving presence? God loves us by showing up. And we can love others by showing up as well. Today, it's a simple message. It's a simple reminder that God has done the most loving thing of all time. He's come into the mess of our sin in order to save us. This shows us that love is about being present to people in their sin and in the mess. Our invitation, first off, is just to be present to Jesus in this season. He's so present to us. Maybe for you, you have questions about Jesus. You have questions about faith or life or church or this whole thing. And maybe you just want to know what it may even look like for God to have shown up or this story that we're talking about, that God came to earth. Maybe you have questions about faith and Jesus and Christianity. Being present for you could look like just going to Alpha, asking questions, talking to friends about Jesus. 
Maybe some of you are followers of Jesus. Well, actually, not maybe. A lot of you, most of you are followers of Jesus. Maybe showing up and being attentive to Jesus in this season is just doing what we say, be with Jesus. Maybe it's finding a spiritual discipline, a way of engaging that keeps your attention and your heart steeped in Jesus and his story and who he is during the Advent season. Our first call is to be present to Jesus. And then the second call is just to be present to those around us. 2020, it was something. It was a mess. And as like I often would say to my friends, it was a hot mess. 2021 could hold anything, right? We don't know what's ahead, yet we don't have to be people who escape or avoid or deny. We can be people of hope, of peace, of joy, and of love. Because Christmas stares straight into the mess of life and boldly declares, as we sang earlier, joy to the world. Something is worth celebrating. Something crazy has happened in the middle of the chaos. God has showed his love by getting into the mess. God got into the mess 2,000 years ago, and he still does it today. Advent is a time where we remember that Christ has come and Christ will come again. So may we be people who just open our eyes with wonder and expectation for God to show up. Would you stand with me? Again, this season, it's about love. It's about being present to God. It's about realizing that Jesus, he's present to us. So just for a moment, I just invite you, yes, in your home, in your living room, probably in a bathrobe, whatever, So stand up for a moment, take a deep breath in, take a deep breath out. Love, the Bible describes God, he's like the spirit, the ruach, the breath. He's closer than the very breath we breathe. So take one more deep breath in and let it out. Realize that God is present to you. One of my favorite definitions of prayer is just being present to God who's present to us. Just responding to God's presence and his attention with our own attention. So just for a moment, if it helps you to put your hands in front of you, do that. But I just want you to quietly just say that famous prayer that the church prays, come Lord Jesus. And in this moment, would you allow him to just draw to mind to show, to reveal ways that Jesus is trying to show up. Maybe it's a mess that he's going to step into. Maybe it's sin that he wants to bring healing to. Maybe it's relational that he wants to help reconcile in this season. I love that the scripture says that when two or more are gathered to deal with the mess of life, There he is in the midst of us. He's a God who's present. Just for a moment. God, how are you showing up to us this year, in this season, in the middle of this mess? Just listen. comes to my attention and my mind even is, um, and I want to pray for you, is uh, two different like types. I mean, I'm just sharing my story of two different types of relational messes, whether uh, it's divorce in the family or relational separation or in my life an engagement ending. And I just have this sense that maybe there's someone today who's watching or listening who understands that dynamic, that sort of mess. And so I just like to pray for you. So Father, thank you that your word says you do not leave us orphans. You don't forsake, you don't abandon. Sometimes you surprise God, but you do show up. And God, I particularly just pray for my family members who are going through it relationally, whether it's a divorce or relational strife or a breakup or family just 
all of that. God, you know it better than I can even imagine it. You're in the middle of it, God. And I just ask that in our church community, God, that every person under the sound of my voice would sense your nearness in this season. God, that we would become people who are growingly aware that you're a God who's close, who's near, who's mighty to save and deliver, who quiets with his love and rejoices over us with singing. God, I ask that in this season, we would become more attuned to your presence. And God, not just more aware, but would you grow our desire in this season for you? Would you grow our desire and our hunger to know you and to love you more, to want you more deeply? God, would we as a church not just be known for being smart or being together or being like people who do acts of justice, but God, more than anything else, would we be people of your presence? Would we become people who, as Moses said, we're nothing without you. We won't go anywhere or do anything or say anything if it's not led by your spirit. God, I ask that even in 2021, there'd be a deepening of our desire, of our love, of our knowing of you, of what we say is being with Jesus. Would you do that in us? Would you show up in every life of every member in our church? Would you actually just surprise people in this holiday season with your love, with your peace, with a sense of hope and a deepening sense of joy? Would you do it, God? We expect it. We anticipate it. We anticipate you to show up this season. Thank you.